a few simple facts. One is that many of the disciplines that you study and that you are taught in the universities are fairly recent. So engineering did not exist up until about the 16th, 17th century. It's not an eternal discipline that has always existed. <coughs> Chemistry is not an eternal discipline that has always existed. These are fairly recent disciplines, accounting even more recent, you know. Um, so this, these disciplines that we, that we are taught and that we study in the universities today are a fairly recent, you know, phenomenon. They emerge at a certain point in the history of a particular region of the world. They emerge many disciplines in medicine, oncology, anesthesia, and all of those disciplines are equally recent, fairly recent. They start as recently as the 1800s. So that's the first point that I want us to keep in mind, that these disciplines that constitute modern knowledge, as they are taught in the universities today, you know, are not eternal. They do not, they do not exist. Now, this claim to be scientific is basically founded on two things. It is that their postulations or their conclusions are valid across time and space meaning that they, have, they claim to have a universal validity. So people in medicine, people in accounting, people in all these disciplines claim that their conclusions are not limited in space and time. They claim, meaning that their conclusions are not limited in time and space. Now I want to suggest to you that this universality that is claimed for scientific knowledge, there is nothing universal about it. I want to suggest to you that even mathematics that is claimed to be universal, that is claimed to have this universal validity, there is nothing universal about it. Now, I would suggest to you that what is universal is something else. It is not the knowledge itself. In simpler terms, what is universal, you create human beings. It means that, that the claim to universality by knowledge is not correct. What is universal is a modern sensibility. It's someone who's modern who accepts scientific knowledge as being scientific, meaning who accepts that scientific knowledge is universal, scientific knowledge is objective and rational. But if it's not clear yet, it will become clear as, as we progress. Because I want to suggest to you at the end that you could create a people who think differently such that this knowledge ceases then to be universal. So if you had people who repudiated their modern sensibilities, modern knowledge would, then, would no longer then be universal. But we'll get to that point. So I thought that I should, at the outset, state that, you know, what is universal is not the knowledge itself. What is universal, in a nutshell, is a modern sensibility. Because, as I said, even mathematics that we claim is universal or has universal validity, there is nothing universal about it. So even the so-called non-temporal truths of mathematics and logic, are temporal in the sense that they are understood by an agent or a mind that is determined by temporal dimensions. So you need first to have a certain sense of time in order to understand mathematics. And so once you generalize that sense of time across the world, then you can claim, or then it becomes possible to claim that those non-temporal truths of logic and mathematics are universal. Because what you have done is to generalize you know, a certain sense of time. But as I've said, even these logics and truths of mathematics are temporal because as we've said, 
they are understood by an agent or a mind that is determined by temporal dimensions. Meaning that if you were to lose the modern sense of time, you would not be able to understand mathematics. If I robbed you of the modern sensibility of time, of understanding time the way in which you understand it, you would not be able to understand mathematics. Simply, if we did away with the time of the clock, you would not be able to understand mathematics. Unless you accept the modern notion of time, of the clock, you know, that disaggregates time in terms of hours, that's the basic, that's the starting point for you to understand, you know, the algebraic formulas that you think of as universal. Because if you did not have that sense of time also, as in the calendar year, or the Gregorian calendar that, you know, we use, you'd also not be able to understand mathematics. So the point, is, it, as it will become clearer, is that what is universal is not this knowledge. What is universal is something else. It's what I call, for short, a modern sensibility, a modern sense of time, a modern way of being in the world, of interacting you know, with the world. Now, <clears throat> so let us get on to trying to understand how do we get to habit this modern sensibility that, you know, then enables a certain kind of knowledge that has a birth date and a birth place. You know, how that knowledge that has a birth date and a birth place comes to be universal. Because even without getting, or even before we get into the crux of the argument, what is it that makes knowledge that is discovered in Europe in the 16th century and the 17th century universal. What is it that makes it universal? Because it's discovered in a particular place within a particular time. So how then does it become universal? Or what is its claim to universality? Or how does that claim to being universally true come about? This is knowledge discovered by a people who are faced with a certain circumstance in a particular context. And then they respond to their lives at that particular time in a particular context. But then their conclusions and their discoveries all of a sudden become universal. How do they become universal? Why do you accept the universal principles of accounting that we are told are universal? Because these are things that evolve out of a particular context to respond to particular situations in particular places. Now, so I'm going to suggest to you that modern disciplines and modern knowledge that you know today as being universally true and valid, as we've said, does not predate the 16th century. So from the 1500s backwards, knowledge existed, but it was not, you know, disaggregated into the disciplines as you study them today. So sociology, biology, you know, physics, chemistry, accounting did not exist prior to that, to, you know, the 1600s, or prior to the 16th century, you know, before universities disaggregated knowledge the way they do today. So there was a different order of knowledge prior to the 16th century, prior to Europe becoming modern. That order of knowledge did not aspire to be universal. It existed in Europe. There was knowledge in Europe prior to the 1600s, but that knowledge did not aspire to be universal. It did not claim for itself a universal validity. So universities are quite old. Um, the oldest European university is the university in Sweden called the University of Uppsala. It starts in, in 11, 1198 or so. But Meaning there is knowledge that is produced, for instance, at Uppsala University from 1100 up until 1600 that does not claim to be universal. Because if it had that universal validity that modern knowledge claims today, it would be taught to you today. Now this claim to universality, this claim that modern knowledge comes to have from the 1600, you know, comes from somewhere, its motivation comes from somewhere. So when Europe 
in the 1600 becomes modern, when Europe transitions into the modern period in the 1600, as we've said, it found knowledge that had existed prior to that, but that knowledge did not have any aspiration to be universal. It was particular, it was relevant to the context within which it developed. Just as it is that you had Euro, I mean rather you had universities in Africa prior to modern universities as they exist today. Even if you forgot for a moment about the University of Alexandra in Egypt, there was University of Timbuktu in Mali. There was universities, you know, in the northern parts of Nigeria um, that existed prior to modern universities existing today. These universities produced knowledge. But at this time, universities as we've said, had no aspiration to universalize you know, their knowledge. Their knowledge was relevant to their particular context. But what changes in the 1600 onwards, what changes when Europe becomes modern, it is that at this point, universities began to delimit what was called knowledge. Even though knowledge had existed prior to this period, from the modern period or from the 1600 onwards, you know, there began something else which was called the delimitation of scientific knowledge. Now, at this point, there is a conscious attempt, there is a conscious attempt to characterize what is called scientific knowledge. So the object at this point is no longer just to produce knowledge, but it is to produce what you can think of as metaphysical or meta characteristics of knowledge, of scientific knowledge. What happens at this moment is that you have people whose object are basically to delineate the characteristics of, of scientific knowledge. They themselves are not engaged in the production of scientific knowledge, but they are engaged in the process of saying, whatever claims to be scientific must have these characteristics. Now, there are three obvious characteristics that you know, scientific knowledge would come to have from the modern period onwards, or from the 16th you know, century onwards. One, it is that scientific knowledge had to be objective. So there is a certain objectivity that scientific knowledge comes to claim for itself. Two, this knowledge claims for itself an element of rationality. So modern knowledge is rational knowledge. So we're beginning to have the boundaries of modern knowledge emerge as these scholars, you know, were engaged in the process of identifying the meta characteristics of modern knowledge. They claim that modern knowledge is objective, modern knowledge is rational, modern knowledge is reasonable. So you have objectivity, you have rationality, you have reason becoming the boundaries of modern knowledge. Now what happens with these three characteristics of modern knowledge you know, coming to the center is that at that moment there is an exclusion of several other knowledges that are not rational, that are not objective, that are not reasonable. So any knowledge at that period that was of sentiments, for instance, was considered not to be knowledge at all, because sentiments are not rational, they are not reasonable. So there is an exclusion, there is a beginning from this moment onwards, an exclusion of certain kinds of knowledges as being outside of knowledge, as not constituting knowledge. Now this is exactly the same time also when there is that distinction between the public and the private realm. But the public and the private realm does not concern us you know, today, except that it has a very close relationship you know, with the development of modern reason sci or modern you know, science because it is considered that science you know, is what explains what happens in the public realm. Whatever happens in the private realm 
was considered to lie outside of science or to lie outside of knowledge. So religion was not in science as it lied in the you know, private realm. Private beliefs, tradition were considered to be in the private realm and so they were no longer objects of knowledge or they could not constitute knowledge. Now in that one stroke, when you say that modern knowledge or modern thought is characterized by being you know, <coughs> reasonable, by being rational, by being objective, you have excluded a whole array of forms of reasoning and forms of thinking that are not rational, that are not scientific, that are not objective. You said that all of these forms of cognizing, all of these forms of exercising thought, <coughs> so you said all of these other forms of cognizing, all of these other forms of you know, being in the world fall outside of knowledge. Because knowledge is what is scientific, knowledge is what is objective, what is rational. So every other thing that is not objective, that is not scientific, I mean rather that is not objective, that is not rational, that is not reasonable, falls outside of knowledge. Now this is the beginning when, of the moment when modern knowledge takes shape. Now this modern knowledge, even though at this point, it claimed to be scientific knowledge. It could still not claim universality for itself. <coughs> it still needed, you know, to give unto itself the universality, you know, of, 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 of character. Because all of this, remember, is still happening in Europe in the 16th century. So those who were engaged in this project were conscious of the fact that this knowledge was evolving or was emerging in a particular place. It was emerging in a particular place, in a particular time, in a particular culture context. This is the Europe, you know, with its own culture context. So it was emerging within a particular culture context. They were conscious of this fact. But the desire to universalize itself needed to find, you know, bases elsewhere. Now the basis would come with, now if we had something to wipe this, um, so they came to universality. There were two challenges that needed to be, you know, um, to be dealt with in order for this objective, rational knowledge to become universal. It was this question of space, the question of time, but also the, the question of culture. So it needed to be able to claim that it was transcultural. It also needed to claim that it was transhistorical, meaning that it applied to all particular, or rather to all historical moments. In as much as this knowledge is emerging in Europe in the 16th century, it needed to claim to be true for all times, for all historical moments. It even wanted to suggest, and as it does today, that you perhaps would think of what you learn in medicine today as being true also of the 1400s. You think that, you know, the solutions you have to disease today, you could apply them to the 1400s. So they are, your conclusions are retrospectively valid, you know, even to prior to the time when they come into existence. That's what universality does because you have transgressed the boundaries of time of the historical moment within which that knowledge applies. So you are literally saying that what you discovered in the 16th century is also true of the 11th century. Do you get the point? Mm -hmm. It's not just the point, it's a paradox. How do you claim that what you discovered in 1600 is true for the 11th century? 
What is it that makes it true for the 11th century? I mean, there are close to five centuries in between, but you want to suggest that you know, your knowledge that is a latter day knowledge is also true of an earlier historical time. But we'll see in a moment you know, how we landed to that point. So the claim to universality needed to address the bounds of time. So it needed to be able to claim to be transhistorical. But also it needed to be able to claim to be transcultural. It needed to be able to claim that it is not limited in its validity by the particular cultural context within which it emerged. So it needed to be able to say that in as much as this knowledge emerges out of the European cultural context, it is also true of the African cultural context. It needed also to be able to say that in as much as it emerges out of the European cultural context, it is true of the Middle Eastern or the Arabic culture context. So it needed to transgress the boundaries of culture. It needed to be able to transgress the boundaries of time. It also needed to be able to transgress the boundaries of space. It needed to be able to travel outside of Europe because if it remained confined in Europe, its claim to validity would have been shallow. I mean, if it claimed to be universal, but it was only known in Europe, that universal validity would have been limited in space and time, or rather in space in this particular context. So this knowledge, in as much as it had already claimed scientificity for itself, it had claimed to be based on reason, rationality, and objectivity, that was not enough to make it universal. It needed something else. It needed resources with which to transgress the bounds of culture, the bounds of time, and the bounds of space. How did it do that? Now, there is one thing that enabled this knowledge to travel the web. It is capital. There is one thing that makes this knowledge able to transgress all of these boundaries. It is capital. It travels the world on the back of capital. So wherever capital has been, this knowledge finds its foot. Or, in simpler terms, wherever capital has been, it ensures that it implants this order of knowledge that emerges in Europe that claims for itself rationality and reason. Do you follow? Yeah. Mm. Now, capital. In simpler terms, capital is much more than just capitalism. But in simpler terms, let us understand what I mean by capital. Let us understand capitalism or the logic of capitalism. So, capitalism had begun to emerge in Europe in the 1500s with what we call merchant capitalism. Now, this capitalism or this form of an economic system began to spread outwardly from Europe, you know, um, as from the 1500s when merchant capitalism uh, was the dominant logic of capitalism. But by the 1600s, <clears throat> merchant capitalism had been transformed <coughs> into modern industrial capitalism. So when the significance of the 1600s, perhaps we must specify. Now the significance of the 16th century, perhaps we must specify. Um, because this is the beginning of the modern period in Europe. This is also when capitalism transitions from being merchant capitalism into modern industrial capitalism. What happens in Europe in the 1600s was basically the beginning of, or the leaving behind of the animate sources of energy into the inanimate sources of energy. This is the time when Europe leaves behind its dependence 
on animate sources of energy and begins to depend on inanimate sources of energy, which is a larger way of, or a more complex way of thinking about industrialization. This is when Europe industrializes. This is the beginning of the industrial revolution in Europe. <coughs> now, the revolution, the industrial revolution that happens in the 16th century transformed the economy of Europe. But it did not only transform the economy of Europe, it did not only bring an industrialized capitalist economy, it brought something else along which we are going to see in, in a moment. So, from the 16th century onwards, there began in Europe what we know as modern industrial capitalism. Now, this modern industrial capitalism was nothing new. It was a continuation of capitalism. Basically, what happens is that at this moment, capitalism morphs into a different stage. There had been merchant capitalism before industrial capitalism. So what happens in the 16th century is that there began a new era, you know, in capitalism. Now, I mention this even though it's not quite related, you know, because of, you know, very pedestrian discussions of globalization. Um, that suggest that you know globalization is a recent thing that began you know um, in the 70s, 80s. Globalization began in the 1500s. Merchant capital sought to universalize itself, to globalize itself. That's why they sent the ships across the seas because capital wanted to be global. What industrial capitalism does, it makes that process even easier because there is now a discovery of much faster and modern forms of transport. With the coming of the technology later on, that globalization takes a different form. So globalization is a much longer, it has a much longer history than the history that is often peddled you know, today as if globalization began with communication technology. Now, it began way before that. But the point is that we want to see how this knowledge would be enabled by capital to become universal, to transgress space, to transgress time, to transgress you know, um, history and culture, rather. So with the coming of modern industrial capitalism in Europe in the 1600s, there is industrialization, hence we call these societies industrial societies. Now the coming of modern capitalism did not just mean the transformation of the means of production. In order for capitalism, modern industrial capitalism to function, it also needed to transform people's outlook. It needed to transform the way in which people thought. It needed to transform the way in which people interacted with each other, the way in which people interacted with the world, and the way in which people interacted you know, with the environment generally. It needed people who had modern sensibilities. In order for capitalism to be able to function, it could not just produce in the factory. It needed people who would see the logic of production in the factory. So in a simpler way, capitalism could not just produce the goods in the factory, in the industries. It needed people who had tastes for those goods. It needed people to value those goods so that they would buy them. Because otherwise, if industrial capitalism went ahead and just produced the commodities that it produced, without creating taste in the people, then these commodities would have become useless. So you needed to create a market, you know, for these commodities that you were producing. So people did not dress the way we dress today prior to the 16th century. But because now there is a modern textile industry that comes into existence with, you know, industrial capitalism, 
What does capitalism say? It says that as a modern person, you must appear in a certain way, you must dress in a certain way. In order for the textile industry to survive. But it did not end there. It also said that as a modern person, you must have this kind of a diet. You must feed in this way. Because you needed people who had certain taste in order to feed, you know, the food industry that was emerging alongside, you know, in Europe in the 16th century. So virtually every aspect of society, as from the modern period onwards, became subject to the logic of capitalism. The way in which we dressed, the way in which we fed ourselves, the way in which, you know, we lived in the world, the kind of housing we lived in, and the kind of amenities that we thought were necessary for us to live, were all supplied to us by the logic of capitalism. These things are not natural. There is nothing natural about the fact that you must eat cereal in the morning. <laughs> you can wake up in the morning and eat sem. Nothing will happen to you. You will continue to live, but capitalism requires you to eat wheat so that the wheat industry will continue to survive. It says to you that of necessity to be healthy, you must eat cereal in the morning. But that is only in order so that the wheat industry must continue to survive. <laughs> so the food culture, everything, virtually everything about our lives became dictated by the logic of capitalism or by the logic of capital. Now this is how then capitalism spreads to the rest of the world because as we've said, you know, capital began to spread outwardly from Europe. Now, wherever capital went, it ensured that it transformed the human beings it encountered there in order that they may appear in a certain way. So when capital left Europe and came to Africa, it met people who had a different sense of time. Our sense of time was not the Gregorian calendar. Our sense of time was not the time of the clock. But capitalism would not have been able to function unless we subscribe to the time of the clock and to the Gregorian calendar because it would then not be able to measure the labor hours that we have put in in a day. And so, wherever capital goes, it ensures that it integrates people into a certain logic of its own functioning. Now, the only reason we need time, as we know it today, it's only so that capitalism would function. You could live in society knowing only day and night. That's enough, without knowing hours. But you need to know hours because capitalism needs to be able to calculate, you know, the labor, you know, time, hours, or ratio that you put in you know, so that it can then remunerate you on the basis of that. And people claiming to be economists because they master the calculations of, you know, labor time calculations. <laughs> Basically, we needed to be able to feed into the logic of modern industrial capitalism. So the entirety of life needed to be transformed in order to ensure that it was in consonance with the logic of capital. So this is how then, wherever capital went, so as it left Europe, it came to Africa, it encountered people who had a different sense of time, it encountered people who had a different sense of dress, it encountered people who had a different mode of being in the world who related to each other differently. It said that the way in which you relate to each other is not congenial to being modern. So you now needed to relate to each other as human beings differently because in order for capitalism to function, you needed a mass society. So our old societies that were, you know, affinal societies where we related on the basis of blood, were told that these societies were not congenial to modern development. Because capitalism needed new sensibilities where 
as a human being in a capitalist society, you are substitutable. Your essence as an individual in a modern system is that you are substitutable. See, as Luazilu Shaba, as a lecturer at UCT, I'm not a human being. I'm basically fulfilling a role and a function. I'm substitutable. I'm just a worker who's substitutable. If anything happens to me, they will remove me and put some, somebody else who's going to perform the same role. So in modern capitalist society, you become basically a functionary that is substitutable. Your humanity as a person gets trimmed down into being basically an element in the turning of the capitalist machine. So virtually everything you do, your aspirations in life, all you're aspiring to is to fit in your shoulder into the cog of capitalism so that it can turn. <laughs> so what happens in the modern period is that industrial capitalism, as we've said, transforms virtually every facet of life so that when you become modern, you become this person, you know, who is knowable. So without knowing a modern person, if I said to you, if you go to India, you are going to encounter a modern person, you have an image of that modern person, isn't it? You can almost tell what that person looks like. It means that now what you have are people who have been standardized universally all over. What you have standardized are human beings who think in a certain way. A modern person in India is a person who subscribes to, you know, the time of the clock, isn't it? It's someone who's going to understand when you say we're meeting at 8.30. When you say there is a modern person in India, you are going to encounter someone, you know, who encounters the world in a certain way, who has a rational, calculable relationship with the world, such that when you encounter that person, and you have an argument with that person, you are likely to say to that person, but what you are saying is not rational. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> or you are not reasonable. Because a modern person you expect is a modern, rational, reasonable person who subscribes to the time of the clock, who's a bane, you know, who has all the features of a modern person. So what capitalism does, wherever it goes, it transforms human beings into a model, a standard model of modern human beings. So what it does is not to universalize knowledge. No. It is not knowledge. It is not oncology. It is not accounting. It is not, you know, chemistry or physics that becomes universal. No. It is a people who think in a certain way. Do you get the logic? So it is a people who, because they are modern, when you tell them about, you know, I'm at the University of Cape Town, I study chemistry, you expect them to understand. So when I say there is a modern person, there are things that this modern person you expect must understand. There is a way in which this modern person must appreciate these things. So when you say to this modern person, I'm at the University of Cape Town, I study oncology, you expect this modern person to be, you know, owed by the fact that you are studying such an important universal discipline, isn't it? <laughs> now you would actually say there is something wrong with this person if the person said to you, oh, okay, oncology, okay. How important is it? <laughs> You think there is something wrong with that person. Because a modern person ought to behave in a certain way, ought to have a certain outlook and a certain rational, calculable relationship with, you know, the world and with everything in the world, including modern knowledge. So, the spread of capitalism outwardly from Europe was to ensure alongside other things, that it created people in a certain image. It created people everywhere in a certain image. These people would become modern rational subjects. These would become modern people who are infused with modern sensibilities, who have a certain modern sense of time, a modern sense of space, 
you know, and all of that. Such that, in fact, to demonstrate further, a modern person is someone who habits space in a certain way. You think that as a modern person, a modern person is someone who habits space in a certain way. So if you encountered a modern person who says, well, I live here, but I make no claim to this place as mine. It is only just a place that enables me to live. I hope in some other time to move somewhere else without laying a claim to this place. You think there's something wrong with that person. Because as a modern person, you've come to think of space as delimited and that must have proprietorship. So when the person says that, I have no aspiration to have proprietorship over the space that I live in, you think that there is something, you know, odd with that person. That person is not modern. In fact, to be modern has become equated with being normal. Um, you know, the norm of modernity has exceeded just the cultural, it has also become a psychological norm. So the norm of being modern, you know, all these things that we've said about being modern, when someone does not fit into them, you think there's something psychologically out of tune with that person. <laughs> there's nothing out of tune with the person at all. It is simply that you assume what is a modern creation to be a natural state of affairs. Modern knowledge is not a natural state of affairs. The world as we live it, in it today could be different than it is today. But So, <clears throat> the universality of knowledge that we encounter in the universities today, you know, would be accomplished. Those limitations of history, space, and time were attended to thanks to the outward spread of capital to the rest of the world. Such that even today, you know, you can have a sense of what capital does wherever it goes. Wherever modern capital gets, it does not just lead to production of commodities. It transforms society, isn't it? So when you take, for instance, industrial capitalist development, to rural areas where these modern precepts of life have been kept at bay. What does that industry do? One factory in a rural area, what does it do? It transforms people's way of life. It transforms their outlook. Everything changes, their food culture, their sense of time, and everything changes. Now this is how modern knowledge traveled the world on the back of capital. But here was the tragedy for us in the continent. It is that capital came to us not just as capital. Capital, its coming to the continent was mediated by yet another process, the process of colonialism. Capital did not leave Europe on its own to come to the continent. It was brought to the continent or its arrival, its birth on the shores of the continent was midwifed by colonialism. So colonialism came to alter the logic of capital. So capitalism as it came to Africa was not capitalism as it existed in Europe. It was capitalism that was now infused with a different logic. A logic summed as the license for the European or for the white to consider the African or the black as less than human. So capitalism comes to us infused with that logic. It comes to us laced with the license for the European or the white person to consider the African or the black as less than human, such that even though capitalism exploits workers in Europe, it exploits workers differently in the continent. Capitalism came to exploit workers in the continent, not as workers, in fact. It came to exploit them as black people. So what happens is that capitalism is not, quote and unquote, does not come into the continent in its pure state. It comes into the <coughs> continent <coughs> 
as colonial capitalism, for the lack of a better term, as distorted capitalism, you know, distorted by the logic of colonialism. So what you find is that the spread outwardly of this modern sensibility to the continent is also a colonial spread. It is a spread of colonialism. Now, so that we may not lose the relationship this has with modern disciplines, you know, that um, we are concerned with the coloniality of knowledge, it is that we must go back to a point we made earlier, that knowledge existed in Europe prior to the modern period. But knowledge prior to the modern period in Europe did not aspire to universalize itself. But there was something else also about this knowledge prior to the modern period. It is that this knowledge was organized differently. As we said, chemistry, biology, history, physics did not exist up until the 1600s. Now what necessitates the disaggregation of knowledge into these different disciplines from the 16th century onwards? Again, the answer is simple. As we said that the production in the factory transforms society and requires people to think in a certain way. Capitalist production also required an order of knowledge that would enable capitalism to reproduce itself. So all the disaggregation of knowledge into different disciplines today was basically a response to the dictates of industrialism. So when the modern period industrializes, the factories soon brought into existence the need for physics. When industrial production came into existence, soon it brought the need for engineering. When industrial capitalism came into existence, it brought the need you know, for accounting, for economics as a discipline as we know it. So, these disciplines themselves emerge specifically in the 16th century in order to save this capitalism. <laughs> these disciplines have no relevance outside of capitalism. If the world were to cease to be capitalist, these disciplines would have no need to exist. Because... If you encountered an honest doctor, medical practitioner, they would tell you that the pharmaceutical industry, for instance, its first objective is not to heal people. Its first objective is to make money. So, Every discipline functions with that logic. So your discipline, whether it is accounting, whether it is engineering, whatever, all those disciplines, at the base of them, is that same logic. How do we enable the maximization of profit? Now, in certain instances, in some other disciplines, that logic is not very direct to the industry. In the social sciences, what we do is to basically fashion people's thinking so that it is amenable to capitalism, so that people then have certain tastes. So marketing, you know, the purpose of marketing is to create in people certain tastes. So when I market cigarettes, for instance, when I work for a <laughs> British American tobacco, my concern is not your health. My concern is how to inculcate in you a taste for a product, a product that you would buy in order that capitalism may continue to reproduce itself. So all the disciplines, some more directly, function with this logic of enabling you know, commodity production of enabling you know, the maximization of profit, some other disciplines do that indirectly 
by inculcating in people a certain you know, outlook that would make them consumers you know, of certain commodities. Now you see this at moments of crisis in any particular you know, society. Any country when faced with economic challenges, when economies contract, as they do capitalist economies contract, and there is less money available for the academy, the first casualties are the humanities and social sciences. It is simply because they are secondary. Their task is to create in people a certain consciousness so that they become consumers. Why is it that when there is a crisis, physics continues to have or chemistry continues to have more importance? It is simply because physics enables directly, you know, the functioning of the capitalist industry. And so, in moments of crisis, it is the social sciences that get less funding or that, you know, whose departments get closed. But also, you only need to, later on in life, you get to know how money circulates in the academy. Money in the academy basically does not follow bright people. <laughs> money in the academy basically goes to those disciplines that directly enable the functioning of capitalism. So that is why there is more money that goes into the sciences than there is that goes into the other disciplines. The importance is not in the disciplines themselves. The importance is in relation to the functioning of capitalism. So you would think, for instance, that public health is an important discipline that should have all the money poured into it. But because public health is not directly related to the functioning of capitalism, money would rather go into the production of drugs rather than go into public health. Because industry is what becomes the allocator of value, even in the production of knowledge. So knowledge itself, you know, its compartmentalization into the modern disciplines was dictated to by the logic of industrial capitalism. So the disaggregation, the disciplines that we habit today, psychology, you know, sociology, and all of these disciplines, these are capitalist disciplines. These are disciplines that are aimed at explaining, for instance, in psychology, the psychology of a modern person. Psychology is not concerned with explaining the psychology of someone who lives outside of a capitalist society. In fact, psychology fails once you take it to those societies that fall outside of capitalism, because psychology knows of a certain structure of the mind. You know, the first thing a psychologist would ask you when you go see him or her is your family, your work. Where do you work? What's the nature of your workplace? Who's your boss? And all of those kinds of things. Because it is assumed that the psychology of a modern person is made up in a certain way. And so these disciplines are structured precisely in that way. Just as it is that if you're a badly trained political scientist, all that you think of are the modern institutions of power. You cannot make sense of those societies that are not structured in accordance with the logic of the modern, you know, um, structure. So, as we near closing, my point so far has been to say that the disaggregation of the disciplines today and of modern thought today is nothing but dictated, uh, a logic dictated by industrial capitalism. So, the universality claimed for knowledge is not the universality of knowledge itself. It is the universality of capitalism, but also the universality of the modern form of life that capitalism imposes to other societies. But as we've said, the tragedy for us in Africa is that capitalism comes to us 
via colonialism. Meaning that when it comes to us via colonialism, it is no longer, quote and unquote, you know, capitalism in its pure form um, as it existed in Europe. It is capitalism that is infused with the logic, with the colonial logic, as we've said, a logic that considers us as less than human being African. Now, this consideration of us as less than human, but also as people who were at the receiving end of the spirit of capitalism, meaning that we're also at the receiving end of knowledge, because remember we said that objective, rational, you know, and objective knowledge travels the world, becomes universal on the back of capital. So it knows where it originates from. Capital knows its source. It's Europe. The knowledge that travels the world on the back of capital also knows its source. It is Europe. So when it encounters us in the non-Western world or in Africa, it considers us always as recipients. So we are passive recipients of this knowledge. It always has to be given to us. We cannot generate it because it has its own place of origin. It has its own culture context. It has its own date of origin, which is Euro. When it comes to us, it has to be fed to us. So we are locked because of colonialism and the spread of capital from Europe to this part of the world we are locked in a certain relationality with modern knowledge. Modern knowledge holds us as African people only as people to be given knowledge, to be accorded knowledge, or to be integrated into <coughs> knowledge. It does not consider us as co-equals in the generation of this knowledge. It does not have, so the categories of modern thought, it's, you know, vocabulary, does not have space to accommodate our own vocabulary. It does not have space to accommodate our sensibilities because it comes to us already fully formed. But not only does it come to us fully formed, it comes to us with a certain arrogance. That is the arrogance of colonialism. We went to Africa to civilize a certain people so that they may enter into rationality, reason, you know, and objectivity. So the task of modern knowledge when it comes to Africa is to integrate us into this you know, modern knowledge. Now, this is where the limitation, for instance, of our discourse on decolonization has been. The desire has been to say, no, there existed in Africa prior to colonialism sociologists. So you must teach us our own sociologists. Or when the discourse comes from, you know, um, those who resist the decolonization, they would say, so if you say you want to decolonize knowledge, who were your philosophers? Or who, who were your, you know, political scientists? Who were your mathematicians? And then we scramble to find sociologists and philosophers in the pre-colonial period and say, no, here they were, you must teach them. Now, you've already lost the battle. <laughs> if, your, if your object is to say, no, we were like you. Like you, we had our philosophers. Like you, we had our you know, um, mathematicians. Like you, we had... What you miss in that whole point is that the... the the, the modular example that you want to be like is given by capitalism. So you're basically saying that we also want to be integrated into your existing categories. So the object of decolonization has to be something else other than getting ourselves integrated into capitalist knowledge. We have to think a little harder into what kind of society we want so that the knowledge we produce would be the knowledge that enables us to perpetuate that kind of society. Because if we accept the logic of colonial modernity, 
If we accept the logic of capitalism that is brought to us by colonialism, what I call colonial modernity, it is that we are going to perpetually remain Peter Pan's children <laughs> who must forever be taught. We would have nothing to teach in return because, as we've said, already the categories are determined, already the vocabulary is determined, everything else is determined. So what you'll be doing is to integrate yourself into an existing structure. And that is why it is possible to find a black person teaching colonial knowledge. It does not necessarily follow that when you have black academics, then you have decolonized knowledge. Because you can have black academics who integrate themselves into the existing you know, corpus of knowledge and perpetuate that same knowledge. And so, the task of decolonization is not the task of replacing Western academics or white academics with black academics. That is necessary, of course. Um, it, is, it, is, it is a starting point. That's where we need to start, but we must go beyond that point because we are not likely to find decolonized education or decolonized knowledge unless we already have inculcated a cadre of black academics that are critical enough and self-respecting enough to want to transgress those boundaries. So I'm going to make one last point and end. Now, <clears throat> when modern knowledge comes to us via colonialism, when capitalism comes to us via colonialism and gives to us the modern disciplines you know, of knowledge, it is afflicted by a certain doubling, a certain contradiction. Colonialism says to us, or the logic of colonialism, the logic of a civilizing mission is that we want to make of the uncivilized or the non-Western people, we want to turn them into civilized people so that they will be the same as us. That's the logic of colonialism. The colonialists come here and say that we want to transform the African, the savage African, into a modern human being so that he may be like us. Now here is the doubling, here is the internal contradiction. It is that the universality that is claimed for Western thought, as we've said, fails, its logic fails at this point. Because if indeed the intent is to bring us into humanity in order to make us the same as the European. Where would the European source of superiority come from when we become the same? So if it becomes possible that indeed we would be the same with the European, if we accept the logic of a civilizing mission that these knowledges are going to transform us into civilized human beings so that we may be like Europe. Where would Europe's source of superiority then lie when we are the same with Europe? Hmm. It means that if you think that these knowledges, if you ingratiate yourself in these knowledges and internalize them, you are going to become like the European, you are accepting that Europe considers you to be human. But Europe does not consider you to be human. The European does not hold you to be human enough, but also Europe knows that its superiority lies precisely in the fact that it is the source of this knowledge that is extended to you. So that sameness, that promised sameness of the civilizing mission is unattainable in this logic. Because Europe would then lose its source of authority and its source of superiority over us the moment we become equal and the same with Europe. So it means that in the structure of these knowledges, there is an ingrained asymmetry between the European knowledge and the African knowledge also. That is why when you then 
get integrated into these Western knowledges, you come in as an indigenous knowledge system. So there is something separate that you bring in. It's called an indigenous knowledge system. It is not knowledge. Knowledge is European knowledge. It does not need a qualifier as European knowledge. No, it is knowledge. But then you can bring in your indigenous knowledge system into chemistry, maybe, you know, into medicine, what were your indigenous practices. But that's not medicine. It's indigenous practices. That is meant to ensure the asymmetry between Western knowledge, you know, and other forms of knowledge. But that is also meant to ensure the superiority of the European over the African, because as we've said, that promised sameness cannot be attained lest the European loses his or her sense of superiority over us. Thank you very much. But also want to let you know, as I guess might have already been communicated to some of you, it's not a one lecture kind of thing, it's a lecture series, right? So today was the first of a possible four or five to, to come. Um, the one we are definitely sure about at this stage is next week, Wednesday, same place, same time. Um, it can't be next week, Thursday, because next week, Thursday is kind of Friday, because there's no school the next day. So moral of the story is, next week, Wednesday, same place, same time. Um, Call your friends, call the people you know to come, I guess, receive the lecture, but also I hope to make it a little more interactive, but I guess we'll speak to Doc about that. And I don't know if you guys have a couple of questions for Doc before you close. Um, can I do this? Yeah, sure. Sure. There's one question. I'll just take one round because it's really late. The next time we'll leave some time for it. One question, two questions, going once, going twice. Sharp. I thought you. Right it? I'm scared. I'll ask two. So my first question is, uh, how do we consider the concept of hijacking of knowledge? I mean, when universities were first formed, it was to centralize knowledge and um, uh, create polymaths, as they call them, and uh, the, 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 the separation of all these knowledges came at a later stage. So how do we think around that? And then also, how do we define ourselves outside the standardized um, way of thinking when this is all that we have known? And then how do we also generate knowledge outside this norm of thinking when it has been imposed on us for centuries? I'm just receiving the questions yeah. and then put in. So, two questions. One, how is it that knowledge can be something that is intrinsic to the universe? Why is it that we have to see knowledge as a discovery, not as an invention and something that is true in of itself? And if we see pre 16th century, there are universities that are existing and they were somehow inculcating knowledge within a certain area, how was this not a hijacking of some knowledge systems that existed within these areas? On a, mi on a micro scale. Okay, then we have one more question from the front here. Um, I feel like there's a strange conceptual distinction between like a capitalism proper and then a capitalism that has this strange feature of colonialism. And so I want to know how you make that, how, how that distinction is possible, because from what I'm understanding, the poor, pure capitalism is the one that exists in Europe as it exists in Europe. And so, but, but this one at the same time is not possible without it, its expansion. Couldn't, couldn't be, which is why, if, if it were possible, 
Europe could have let go of, there would be no neocolonialism. Okay? So that pure capitalism that exists inside Europe, as it is Europe, is also not, not a capitalism devoid of, of a, colonial, a, a colonialism that, that makes it exist, that is, that is a necessary condition for its existence. So the, the distinction between a capitalism in the deal and the one that we get, I feel like this distinction is, is I don't know, yeah. <laughs> you get it. That was it. Okay, <clears throat> so let let us begin with the last question. Um, I think the point the point you're making is quite valid in the sense that um, if you think mm. of capitalism anywhere in the world. Capitalism is already racist. Uh, anywhere where capitalism <coughs> functions, it's racist. Why is it racist even when it is found in Europe? You know, where even in, in a European context where they are only European. It is because ingrained within capitalism is a certain sense of value. Now the sense of value says that there are human beings who are of value, there are human beings, you know, who are less than valuable. Now, when they are not found within Europe, it does not then make European capitalism less racist because those people of value are not available in Europe. Such that at the slightest moment, when that particular European country receives immigrants who are not European, automatically their place in that society is defined. So fly into any European country today, walk into the toilets, it's black people who clean them. Because already when they get there, their place in that society by capitalism is already defined by the allocation of value, you know, to human beings in terms of, you know, which humans have value. Now the point is the same then with colonialism. Capitalism is ingrained with a logic of colonialism because within capitalism there is a desire to spread and capture more markets. So capitalism already had a desire to spread within, ingrained within its logic was the desire to spread to the rest of the world. So if it had spread to the rest of the world, not through colonialism, what would have been its feature? Its feature would have been different. It would have continued to exploit. It would have continued to exploit workers as it exploits workers in Europe. If there hadn't been the race science that says that African people are less than human and there was no colonialism, but capitalism just spread, it happened to have this you know, universal sense of being, it would have spread, but its functioning would have been infused with a different logic than the logic of colonialism. So what becomes possible, for instance, in colonial societies as in South Africa, is that you do not only exploit workers as you exploit workers in Europe, you pay them even less than you pay workers in Europe, because capitalism makes that possible, you know. So, my suspicion <coughs> is that colonialism, its link with capitalism, of course, differs depending on you know, whether it is capitalism in Europe or it is capitalism in the colonial world. Um, but I would... So, um, maybe to make just one other point about you know, that, that, that pure form of capitalism expressing itself you know, um, in, in, in... Now, <clears throat> capitalism as it exists, in the world, suppose it were robbed off of its neo-colony. It will continue to function. Mm -mm. Impossible. Capitalism would continue to function if it were robbed off of its colonies or if it were robbed off of its access of you know, the non-Western world. But what will then have to happen, it would have to excise out of its logic. It would have to kick out of its logic 
the assumption that there is always a place somewhere where you can access resources at less than the market price. So it would have to internally adjust itself or adjust its functioning, but it would continue to function. But capitalism in the colonial world is a dependent capitalism. Because if you cut non-Western, if you cut Africa from the West, capitalism would not be able to function here. It's entirely dependent on the West. It's a dependent capitalism. If Europe cut us off from its technology, it would be a positive thing. I'm not saying it's a negative thing. It would be a positive thing because then a different society would emerge, but it would not be capitalism because it would be cut off you know, from the logic of capitalism so from be. somewhere. Now, coming to the different, or rather to the question about uh, is knowledge intrinsic to the universe? And shouldn't we consider knowledge as something that is intrinsic to the universe? I'm going to exemplify my answer with, or rather my answer with, I'm going to give you my answer in a question. Now, you see, if you walk out of here and you met, you saw a guava tree outside, all you would see is a guava tree. If it doesn't have fruits, it's just a guava tree without fruits, isn't it? There is somewhere else in the world where people, when they walk and see a guava tree, in the guava leaves they see, you know, something they use in order to make a guava leaf, leaf soup. If you go to Cameroon today, one of the delicacies they would serve you is a guava leaf soup. Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> so if knowledge was intrinsic to the world, how come we didn't know? Knowledge is not intrinsic to the world. You know, um, we, do not, we do not pick knowledge or sense knowledge of the world. You know, uh, knowledge comes at an encounter. It's, it lies in between the world and yourself. The way you encounter it, then somewhere there in the middle emerges knowledge. How you relate to that guava tree. So you know that in, in moments of heat, it provides you with a shade. You know, then you go sit underneath. Knowledge emerges there in between. At the moment when you say that, this guava tree, when it's hot, I can sit underneath it, and then emerges knowledge. It's not intrinsic to it. It is, it is something that, you know, comes into existence, as I've said, as you encounter, you know, um, the empirical world. Now, there is a more sophisticated way of putting it, of course, you know, which is that empiricism does not constitute knowledge. You know, the empirical world is not what constitutes knowledge. Now, if you thought of the empirical world as being what constitutes knowledge, all you'd be saying is that when you see an empirical object like this, automatically in your mind it elicits knowledge of a pen or a pencil. You know, it triggers in you knowledge of, of a pen or a pencil. Now, there are people who, if you put this thing in front of them, it doesn't trigger that knowledge. <laughs> Just as it is that... First, in order to appreciate the roses that you give to people, I must know that it is a rose. So it's not automatic, it's not intrinsic that when I appreciate you, I must give you roses. No. It's, it, it's, something, it's something that emerges as I encounter something, you know. Um, the empirical world, the roses planted there do not give me the knowledge of them as, 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 as roses, you know. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure I understood the hijacking of knowledges, the point about hijacking of, of knowledges. Um, so if I understood you to be saying perhaps if knowledge is available for that kind of appropriation, we could also appropriate Western knowledge. Um, that's, the, that's as far as I can make sense of you know, what you were saying. But now it is... You know, there is a way of thinking that is very, that is very, you know, um, post-colonial, that assumes that, you know, truth flows, you know, from the coherence of the sentence. Now, people tell us that, you know, uh, we could appropriate Western knowledge, you know, and make good use of it. 
why don't you say we have the capability to generate our own knowledge? Why do we need to appropriate other people's knowledges? Why don't you confer to us, you know, the same capability as the Europeans who generated it, you know, from scratch? You know, uh, the same capability to us to generate our own, you know, knowledge. Because when you appropriate something, already you are conceding certain ground. It's a compromise. Um, so when you appropriate, the categories are already determined for you. The language is already determined for you. You know, the parlance or the vocabulary is already determined for you. And, you know, in that appropriation, again, that asymmetry that I spoke of, of the European and the African, comes into being because you are appropriating or you are hijacking someone else's, you know, knowledge that already puts you in a certain relationality. That appropriation does not reverse that asymmetry between you and the European or between us as African people and European knowledge. So something else needs to happen rather than just appropriation. You know, um, I think it needs to go beyond just, beyond just, um, beyond, beyond, you know, the hijacking of knowledge. But it's late. <laughs> so, to the Macquadians in the house, please stay behind and help us reorganize the dining hall because people had empty breakfast. <laughs>